Uh, now, where was like since this since this uh, library or uh, the the archive was kind of a part of a I guess associated with a shrine complex or something like that. Like now, was it tied to any types of like rituals or things like that? Did they did they you know bring it out and uh, parade this information? Like how how was it utilized? Is what I'm kind of trying to ask. Like what what significance did they put on it that it it is something to to keep safe? Like what did it give? to them i suppose yeah the, 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 there's only one record that i can think of that addresses what you're asking um there is in fact a first dynasty bone tag it's a it's a it's a it's a year uh it, it refers to a special year all, all of these tags were basically instead of you know writing the, the year uh, numbers the ancient egyptians refer to a year in terms of what happened during that year and so you have a you have a sort of a square like bone tag, and on that bone tag you have information carved in. And on this particular bone tag, there is a sem priest that's a, a shaman priest in those early days that is dragging or carrying a box behind him on 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 a sled. And in in uh, in one of the Egy uh, German Egyptologists reconstruction, his name is Wolfgang Helk. So Wolfgang Helk interpreted this this to mean that he was aiding a princess you, you can see her next to the, the the shaman priest and the princess is ill or has some problem and he's basically attending to her using this box that he's dragging now i don't know if that box is the same as the afdet as the ark um, but that's the closest one to uh in terms of written evidence that i can list right now to answer your particular question in terms of a ritual Okay. The, okay. the only other thing that comes close to it is a ritual that's in the pyramid text. So if you if you are in the pyramid of Unas and you are in the antechamber and you're looking east, or I should say northeast, um, this is now Unas is a perfected spirit. Um, he has learned the language of magic, which allows you to break through barriers to ascend into the sky. But there's still one more barrier, and that is a cave. And that cave is mentioned in the northeast corner. He has to appease the primordial gods of creation. And after that, he can now escape from the confines of earth and ascend. his spirit can ascend into the sky. Um, and so that cave, interestingly, is mentioned. Uh, the dimensions of that cave cluster in the northeast corner. And in our reconstruction, the antechamber is the Great Sphinx. That's a reconstructed Sphinx, basically. And so the northeast corner is the left forepaw. Uh, and so that is what I would call sort of a, a cryptic a reference to a cave that contains the final instructions that the, the spirit, the royal spirit needs in order to ascend to the sky. Um, so that is a sort of a ritual. It's, an, it's, an, it's a, basically a final rite of passage in order to escape from the cave that, that represents earth to then be able to be a free spirit in the sky. Uh, now, is that does that that idea like precede the 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 mummification like rituals and the kind of the, the the cultural significance that they put on it, where it's like the the uh, I forget what the the name for the soul, where it would it would ascend out, it would take the form of a bird and then you know ascend right. out from wherever the ferret and then to be judged and so this is at the end right <laughs> so you, yeah yeah that's a great question so uh, imagine the way that the chambers are basically divvied up is that the northern end of the uh, sarcophagus chamber is where the uh, is the car so this is the life force it gets its food and drink you know there's a whole wall dedicated to conjuring up or or i should say raising sort of the idea of food and so that's where the car uh, uh reanimates and on the southern side is where the Ba resurrects. So you have Ba, which is the soul, Ka, which is the life force. And then they, they join in the antechamber to form an Ach. And an Ach is, a, is basically a uh, initiated spirit that is able to travel the sky. But the spirit still receives training in the antechamber. So in the gable, there's a section called the cannibal hymn. And in the cannibal hymn, after that cannibal hymn, the, the spirit basically consumes the magic wisdom of the ancestors. That's, it's called the cannibal to him because they're, it, it literally, the spirit is eating the, the forefathers and foremothers. But it is an allegory for learning the knowledge of, 
of uh, magical uh, communication. And so after that gable, then comes the final stretch, which is the east wall of the antechamber. And in our construction, that is the front of the Sphinx with the two forepaws. And there, the spirit faces all the, the final challenge. So fighting snakes and scorpions, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that's the final battle. And when he makes that, then he graduates, so to speak. He faces the primordial gods of creation in that cavern, the primordial cavern of creation, the Genesis cave. And when he emerges from that cave, he is ready. He strips his robe, and that's mentioned in the last portion of the pyramid text. He strips his robe, he's free, and now he's ready to ascend into the sky. Um, and interestingly, the pyramid text sent the, 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 the spirit both to the east and to the north. Um, so that's kind of an interesting bifurcation. So one part of the spirit goes north to the imperishable stars uh, around the North Pole, and the other portion uh, resurrects in the east to only to die in the west and then come right back in the east. So there's a two, two forms of immortality. There's a cyclical type of immortality uh, where you resurrect and die, and then there is an eternal existence around the North Pole where you're always alive, and that's the imperishable uh, star zone. So, th so, the, so the answer to your question is that all of that happens after mummification, after resurrection, after reanimation of the Ka, after reunification of Ka and Ba to form an Ach spirit, after the training of the Ach to become a magician, a perfected magician, after the final battle, and after emerging from that cave with the Eye of Horus in the hand, so that you can now go up, which is the final goal of the whole thing. Ooh, and we thought our funeral practices were complicated now. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, they, you know, they knew that this was a complicated journey. Uh, and they, that's why they ritualized it and they, they needed magical spells. And to them, this was, so this is not just, that's why people, when see people saying pyramids is just a burial, I completely understand the alternative historians that they have a problem with this because it's not just a grave. It's to me, this is really a resurrection machine, but it's but a machine still doesn't do it justice. It's actually a textually simulated resurrection chamber. And and the, 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 the verbal aspect of this is really important. It's not like mechanical wheels turning in that sense. No, it's not like a time machine, for example. No, it's something it's 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 verbal and that is really important because the ancient egyptians believe that creation happens verbally phonetically they believe that the world was created just like uh, abrahamic religions believe to the word of god so Spoke when god into existence that's right you say it into you utter it into existence and that is why this resurrection machine is really a textual simulation of this whole journey and it, it culminates by entering the actual Genesis cave, the cave, this is my interpretation, from which God, the, 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 the creator God created the universe from a cave with the words of God stored in this hall of records. And the, the, the king spirit wants to go back to that cave because the ultimate feat is to be able to create yourself back into the sky where the gods came from. And in order to do that, you have to re-enter that cave. And this is all mapped out in the Pyramid Text. It's beautiful. Um, so Robert Nail and I, we published this. I published a couple of papers to highlight this. And um, at Contact in the Desert, I am going to get into the details of how this is done. Now, it's a I real matrix. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, yeah. that's a whole that's a whole podcast series on its own, just examining yes. those ancient yeah. rituals. Right. But now we started the podcast off saying that uh, the pyramids of Giza seem to mirror Orion's belt at different processions. So that must be over, you know, a procession is what, 2,100 years or something? So yeah, now 25, if, about 26,000. Like the full cycle through all of the... Yeah, approximately 26. Right. Yeah, 25,920 25, years. So for the earth to wobble, one full procession is that long. Yes, yes. Now, because this is a question I've always had after, you know, watching the pyramid code and all these other things and graham hancock's work is it's it's obvious i mean 
the Egyptians were there. They must they built on, at least built onto the pyramids or completed them in some fashion. But what, if the, if there was a culture before who had built these pyramids seemingly much before the time of ancient dynastic Egypt, what was what was built there first? If anything, if 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 we're going that route, like something must have been there if it was before right. the time of Egypt, and then either Egypt, the the modern like what well, the ancient we call it ancient now, but for them they were the new culture back then. Like how like what was built there before, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So let's talk about let's see the great let's look at the Great Pyramid. The the least that John Paul and I agree that the minimum that may have been there before was uh, a mount. And into that mount was the descending passage that leads to the subterranean chamber um, and, you know, everything that's attached to that. And then there is the grotto. I don't know if you know about that. The grotto is a little bit higher up uh, and there's a connection to the grotto. So we believe that that may have been there originally. And then something was built on top of that. Um, and the newest, based on the newest findings, which includes the muon data and the, the architectural insights that John Paul and I are pursuing, we think that maybe um, there were there, the plans for the Great Pyramid were were pre-existing, but the original pyramid that was built only executed portion a portion of that plan, and that original execution uh, included only the Queen Chamber which was entered through a horizontal passage that came from the area under the chevrons. So John Paul has predicted for a long time and other researchers probably just the same that the original entry was a horizontal passage from the chevrons straight across to the queen chamber. And then what we think happened after that is that maybe Khufu came along and he asked his architects and engineers to create another chamber higher up and that became the king chamber. And in order to do that, they needed uh, to modify what had already been built. Uh, for example, they had to cut portion of the ascending passage had to be cut into what was already built. Um, as you know, Jean-Pierre Rodin thinks that the Grand Gallery and the ascending passage was some sort of a counterweight system. And some people agree, some people don't agree. But at the end of the day, um, what you're asking is the, the easiest, the, 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 the answer that I would give to that is that there may have been three stages. The first stage was a primordial, a primordial stage uh, with uh, just a descending passage and then came maybe an intermediate pyramid. And then after that, Khufu finished it into the Great Pyramid. But the plans were always there. It's just that they weren't fully executed until Khufu came along. Right, and that and that original say, if even if it was just a mound, would have been. They would have had to know about our um, astronomy. They would have had to know yeah, how, that's how why. to do it. How, yeah. yeah. So Robert Bouval, for example, I believe he said at one point that he thinks, yes, the pyramids may have been built in the old kingdom, but the foundations for those pyramids, be aligning in this way to the belt stars. At uh, Zeptepi, 10,500 BC, those those foundations were laid down long before. I think this is how Robert reconstructed it. Now, is 10,500 oh, BC yeah. is that? Because um, when Graham Hancock talks about like the Younger Dryas hypothesis, what yes. what was the? Is that that must be close to around the end of the Younger Dryas, right? Well, yeah. The, well, the the beginning of the Younger Dryas is something like 10.8. And the end is nine six, so it's about twelve hundred years. Um, so ten five would be in the first third of the younger dryas. Right. I'm just I'm just trying to put some theories together. So, because mm -hmm. they always talk about if if humanity did become advanced, not in the same way we are with you know microchips and plastics mm -hmm. and all that, but in a different way, and then some type of global cataclysm, you know, wiped humanity out to a fraction, like a let's say a fraction of a percent of people, all that technology over thousands of years was lost, mm -hmm. except the survivors of that culture. Yes. Um, make, making, you know, Gebekli Tepe and other ancient sites to kind of preserve the, all the, the only way they knew how to preserve knowledge over time is in stone. And so like Gebekli, Gebekli Tepe, they make all these stones, they backfill them in hopes that maybe a future civilization will look, dig them up decipher them and kind of 
they, they're telling us their history from the past. So I was, I was just curious if there's any evidence, kind of like a, a Gobekli Tepe age civilization in like before Egypt. Uh, well, the, the, Robert wrote about this uh, in uh, Black Genesis. Um, he also touched on it in Imhotep, Architect of the Cosmos, um, that the Napta Playa culture basically had the um, the know-how to cut stone, to, to drag heavy stones, and to align them astronomically in the um, in the Western Egyptian desert to create calendar circles, as you know, complex structures with emanating processional lines. And, you know, all of this, Thomas Brophy, if you, I don't know if you know him, but Thomas Brophy is an astronomer, and he joined Robert in uh, going to, to that place, a special place, Napta Playa, um, so that you could call that a, 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 a lost civilization that that developed some of this knowledge. If, for example, procession. And in Under the Sphinx, I had to decide if procession, for example, was inherited by the ancient Egyptians or if they organically developed it. Um, and so in the book, I decided probably that was organically developed. But the idea of a of a heliocentric solar system, obviously they didn't know that. So that had to be in my reconstruction that's inherited. Um, and so if there was such a lost civilization and they they didn't survive in large numbers, they had a few survivors and they carried their knowledge, they stored it maybe in different places. And I know that Graham is looking for a hall of records, just like I was looking for a hall of records in Egypt. And I'm sure that Graham is looking for a hall of records elsewhere. Um, and so in, because he thinks that those were the Apkalu, the seven sages in the Sumerian mythology, that they're, they're basically the representatives, the, the representations of these survivors from the lost civilization. And they sort of spread out like a diaspora, different parts of the world, and they carried their knowledge with them, their metrology, their, their writing, maybe, you know, all the, the seeds of civilization, they carried that with them. And then they fertilize, so to speak, different parts of the world with their ideas and their know-how. And one of those places may have been Gobekli Tepe. One of those places may have been the Nile Valley. Um, and one of those places may have been an archive, a cave uh, in Giza. And a, a linus was carved to guard it, uh, as sort of as a monumental shrine to, to mark the spot here. Look here, there is knowledge hidden from a prior cycle of civilization. Um, you know, so this is sort of in a nutshell the model. And not only knowledge, but a, not only knowledge, but like a, um, like a like a time capsule. If you go with the procession, like that's right. Like here's exactly. the line facing this way at this time. If you look back, this that's is when right. this was built. This is this is where it is. That's right. In under the Sphinx, I reconstruct an exact date actually. Um, because uh, so what I'm proposing is that it wasn't the sun that was being tracked, but it, what was being tracked was an equinoctial eclipse. So it's a it's a lunar event, and that is really rare. Um, and so that's why I'm proposing an actual date. So I think the the, the Mahit statue, the original line of statue, was commemorating a specific date when that archive was laid down. Now I I have to. That's really cool. Yeah, but I have to say that. My main thrust is uh, is to falsify the Kafir narrative. And I think we have done this now with Egyptological evidence, with written evidence, is that the Kafir story that he built the Sphinx from the ground up cannot be correct. Because we have written references now that date to before the time of Kafir. Um, but because I can only take the writing back to 500 years earlier, I have to defer to my colleagues like Graham Hancock, Robert Boval, Robert Schock, because they have different kinds of evidence. They have geological, astronomical evidence. They're making the case that, um, you know, this, that, that statue is much, much older. So, you know, it's like 12,000 years old. Um, so I defer to them on, on telling us how old this statue actually is. But in terms of me, I looked at this as a scientific, with scientific logic. And in science, you falsify models um, and the, uh, the evidence that I'm putting forward in the book to, in my opinion, falsifies the, the Lehner model, the George Reisner model, Zayawas, all these people, they're the ones that basically think that Kafre constructed the Sphinx from the ground up. 
Now, I just had a question because one, you said with your book, you're hoping to make compelling argument to basically drill right and and find out once for once once and for all is what you said if if there is a a a void down there what what is the pushback what do you think the pushback is um to make like to find these discoveries and run these projects what do you think what's the biggest barrier to these things um i i think the one of the biggest barriers is that um hawass wants to discover those things on his own i think he wants to have his name on the discoveries he doesn't want to and maybe the Egyptian antiquities uh, uh, ministry doesn't want foreigners to to basically uh, claim the price for something like that. And for me, that's actually okay. I am. I don't need to. I don't need the accolades. For me, you know, I look at this as a as a collaborative project with the Egyptians. If Zaya was wants to do the drilling and claim the credit, that's fine with me. Um, but I could definitely the, see it from your perspective, where it's if you've been following this breadcrumbs, you're like, I don't care who finds the next one i just no. need to know if this is if i was right, right yes on, uh, in what i'm what i'm researching so yeah. I, I can see that you know one of the one of the theories that you know i i've in reading about egypt and, and studies in egypt and stuff is that um you know, maybe there's a little bit of a conspiracy that they it's they don't want it to affect tourism right like and and they put yes. up all these barriers to so they can keep the mystique because if we don't if there's all these mysteries that we can't solve then they mm-hmm. remain mysterious and we could they can draw on the masses because you know they, it is a huge money maker for uh yes Egypt, is absolutely that, that's also part of it. i completely agree with you um so it's not this is not a, a, a completely uh liberated scientific endeavor what goes on in egypt there's politics involved there's a lot of money involved there's the flow of information the control it is involved um and you know so i don't have any illusions that as a as an individual that i have any sway to convince somebody in you know in the ministry to do another drill i i understand that but um at least now they can say that there's no egyptological evidence for an archive under the sphinx because there is um before they could say you know, I mean, Shock can say whatever he wants. He's a geologist, but you know, we are Egyptologists, and we think that the Sphinx is is a Kafir statue. But now they can't say that, not with a straight face, because they are aware of us. I know that Mark Lehner knows about our publication because I gave it to him. Uh, he knows that there is a carving of a lioness statue in front of a temple that predates. Kafir by 500 years. I, I gave it to him and I gave it personally. I gave it to Zaya Was on a big poster, thick paper, just a couple of months ago. So they can't say that they're not aware of this. Um, and, um, you know, so that's how it happens. Gradually, people will put pressure on them. You know, they're going to look ridiculous if they keep making mm-hmm. those claims. Um, at some point, well, we're going to get an experiment. And it, I, I just think it's one of those things where people. And I think it's just a human trait, unfortunately, where people dig their heels in the sand and they're yes. like, this is how it was. And, you right. know, I'm the expert on this and it can't be any other way. Right. And so it's like, you know, it's for them to sometimes if something new comes, that means everything they've been saying for their life's work has been either incorrect or maybe just a little off. Right. Yes. Which then, you know, it hurts the human ego sometimes in these kind of yeah. things. Yeah. I, I, and that's, um, and that goes, the, that, that goes both ways. So for, for example, I have to be aware of the possibility that I could be wrong. Of course I could be, they could be right. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so, and so that, so the, the, it's an important thing not to get married to a model. Uh, in science, um, yeah. and I'm not more married to model. I'm willing to let go of it, but I wanted to even the playing field because the the, well, we gotta the look. Stat- that's the thing. We got to look. We got yeah, to take gotta a look. Peek, that's right? We got to look. Yeah. We got to look. Yes. <laughs> we can't and just I say no have... and not look because then you're shutting that down. <laughs> that's right. And I'm I'm not going to walk away just because they're not letting us go and drill because I am in the process as we speak to um, repeat a satellite radar experiment that was performed by two Italian researchers that just recently published an amazing paper. They found spaces inside the Great Pyramid that we didn't know existed, um, s- several spaces. And they used a, that was, an amazing... That was just, re- that was just yes. recently, wasn't it? Like yeah, March yeah. 2nd or something. Yeah, that's right. And so at this point, I'm actually together with a small team, uh, including a geophysicist, and we are 
replicating the method. We are learning how to, what they did, because they didn't publish all the details, but so we're replicating first the method. Um, and we already have a satellite image of the Sphinx. Um, we're going to need another image that is from a slightly different angle. And so the ultimate goal is to use the, excuse me, use that technique to show that there's a space under the left, under the left forepaw. Uh, and that technique is just the best technique that I've seen so far. It's better than uh, ground penetrating radar, better than electric conductivity. Um, and so this will blow the lid off of this whole thing. If, if we can show with this technique that there is a large space under the, under the left forepaw, then we got it, okay? And we don't need a permit to do this scan because it's up in the sky where Horus is flying, okay? So we are the eye of Horus yeah. right now. We're <laughs> looking straight down. And if we can replicate this experiment, then this is going to be a big hit. Um, I think the time schedule, to give you an idea, we might be able to get this out in a publication maybe late this year or early next year. So we're working oh, on it as we that's speak. That's really cool. Any any time frame of when you plan to or hopeful window when you plan to run this experiment? Uh, well, we have we already have a scan, and we're now what we're working on right now is the signal processing of it. It's it's, it's very difficult uh, to replicate this what Biondi and Malanga did, um, but uh, the the guy that we're working with uh, is uh, is uh, is one of the top guys in remote sensing. He's he's top. Um, and so I am, and I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago where, where he thinks this is going to go. And he's fairly confident that we'll be able to replicate this experiment. It's actually an easier experiment for the Sphinx. It's easier to look for a space under the, under the left forepaw than it is to look for spaces inside the Great Pyramid. Um, so our task is actually easier as long as we can figure out how Biondi did his signal processing, his filtering, and, you know, his reverse Fourier transform and all those things. And he's working on it. We will probably have a huddle next month or in, uh, in, in May. I think we're going to have a huddle in, in Arizona like we did in January. Um, and then I will probably have a relatively good idea if this is going to go through or not. So if there's going to be an update, maybe before contact in the desert, I might be able to tell you something. Oh. Excited. Save, save that oh, awesome. for contact in the desert for all the people who wanted to come uh, and, and see live. <laughs> They're listening to this if you want to get a good update. Um, yeah. You can see uh, Manu and at contact in the desert, June 2nd uh, to 4th. Um, I, that's all that time we had for you, Manu. Thank you so much for coming on. This is amazing yeah, thank you very to much. talk to you. Awesome yeah. conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. We, yeah, great questions, guys. And and, uh, if, pe if people want to find you, where, where's the best place to look you up? Um, I am on Facebook. I am on YouTube. Um, I have an Academia EDU page where all the publications are. A lot of these are free access. So, uh, and then I have on, on Amazon with the book. Awesome. We'll post uh, some of those. Under... We'll post those links in the podcast description as well. If uh, you're too lazy to go search it for yourself, just click, uh, click in the under the Sphinx. The search for the hieroglyphic key to the real Hall of Records. That's uh, right on Amazon. Yes. Um, stick around just for a second because we'll give you the instructions on how to finish uploading this. And for the rest of you all, uh, head to contact in the desert. Buy your tickets. They've got an amazing lineup of speakers and guests uh, June 2nd to 4th. And as we always say at the end of these things, keep those eyes on the skies. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I know it's annoying to watch these broken up in 10 minute segments, but Here's the next one over here. Or if you want to watch the whole thing uncut and after hours, just click this link to our website and uh, give us a donation. You get full access to it on Patreon. Anyways, thanks, guys. Enjoy the next video.